coming to my second lecture um, entitled Political Identities Within Africanism. Uh, and because we have limited time and nationalism is a quite uh, well researched and popular topic, we will focus tonight on those um, Afrikaners who uh, acted in movements that we would categorize as left of the Afrikaner, or of the Afrikaner nationalist movement. Um, so unionists, uh, progressives, liberals, and even communists. Let us uh, start off with a few politicians and end off with two people who, though not politicians, voiced their opposition to um, the nationalist movement uh, through uh, social activism. So first off, we have to start with Jan Smets. Um, arguably the <coughs> most famous Afrikaner outside of South Africa's borders. Uh, he was born in 1870 in the Cape, um, and in the Cape Colony, it was under British rule. Uh, and he went to England to study uh, law at Cambridge. He was an outstanding student. And um, my husband will not forgive me if I don't mention that there was this Scottish uh, Scottish chemist who won the Nobel, Peace, uh, Nobel Prize for Chemistry, uh, who was uh, in the 70s, he was head of the college that Smiths went to a century earlier. Uh, and he said that in all of its history, Christ College, which was founded in like the beginning of the 15th century. so. In, in five centuries, there were only three outstanding students, John Milton, who was an English poet, uh, Charles Darwin, and Jan Smits. Mm -hmm. So, uh, he definitely made a name for himself. Uh, and when he returned to South Africa, he became involved in the politics of the Cape. He was pretty close with Cecil Rhodes. Uh, however, he became disillusioned and moved to Pretoria, uh, which was um, the South African Republic at that time, and became a state's attorney. He tried to avert war with the British. Uh, however, when that was not possible and the World War did break out in 1899, he, um, along with his fellow Afrikaners, uh, fought on the Mandel and he was one of the signatories of the Treaty of Torianafan in 1902. Um, and uh, I put up a quote by him. Um, Comrades, we decided to stand to the bitter end. Let us now, like men, admit that that end has come for us, come in a more bitter shape than we ever thought. I uh, want to stop for a moment because uh, this is really the bitter end. So, um, the question uh, that um, uh, we are often faced with um, in life is <laughs> not if our opponents uh, actually have a different goal than us, uh, but uh, it's about the methods, and the situation was the same with Smith, who, even though he would become very, uh, he would be seen as this extreme British loyalist that uh, betrayed his nation, uh, or the Afrikaner folk, uh, he, not only did he fight in the war, uh, he admits that he fought to the bitter end. The question was, or the difference between him and, um, and, uh, uh, what's the word, the extremists, uh, was that he believed that the bitter end already came in 1902 and now it was time to stop uh, and move on and accept the reality, while people like um, Christian de Vett, uh will uh, believe that the, this was just a um, momentary um, Armistice, and whenever the opportunity arises, the world will all have to be uh, reunited. Uh, so, um, uh, Smiths uh, and basically everyone who did fight in that war until 1902 were bitter The difference between them was when did that end come and if it actually came in the first place. Um, after the war, uh, along with General Louis Botta, Smiths uh, established a head folk party, which is, well, we are Afrikaners, correct? So it means the people uh, party. Uh, and um, it led Transvaal um, until the Union of South Africa in 1910. 
Um, <coughs> when all the four colonies uh, were consolidated into the Union of South Africa, it became the South African Party and led to the entire Union. Louis Botha became the Prime Minister and Jan Smith uh, was in his cabinet. Uh, the two men uh, at the top, that would be Louis Botha and Jan Smith. Um, Smith uh, held the portfolios of mines, interior, um, so interior affairs, defense, and finance. So he was a pretty powerful guy, um, and he uh, he was not liked very much. Uh, but uh, we do not really have time to go into um, why people didn't like him or all the reasons people didn't like him. But one of the reasons was he um, held all that power. So he was basically the second most powerful man after the Prime Minister Louis Bota. Um, in uh, at the beginning uh, of their uh, governance, so in 1912, around uh, strikes um, occurred uh, throughout the country, and uh, Smith was uh, quite ready to use force to suppress them, uh, and he um, used force again in 1914 uh, when the First World War broke out. Uh, and like I mentioned, Christian de Vett was looking for an opportunity uh, to um, start fighting against the British again. They believed, um, I mean, I'm using Christian de Vett because I think he's the most recognizable name out of that group, but there were many um, that, uh, about 12,000 Afrikaners, but decided that this was the opportune moment to take up arms again. So, um, 1914 is the Maritz Rebellion or the African Uprising, uh, both names are applicable, and um, Louis Borta, along with Jan Smuts, uh, used the, the newly formed Union Defense Force against their own people. Um, and those that did not die were imprisoned and fined. Uh, considering the situation, I mean, this was treason, basically. Uh, the people that rebelled did have um, it pretty easy. They spent only five to seven years in prison. So um, there was actually only one that was executed, but that's because he didn't quit his job in the defense force before he led people. So um, the, the others at least quit their official government jobs before taking up arms against the government. Uh, okay, so during the First World War, South Africa's involvement uh, included the invasion of Southwest Africa, uh, which was led by Louis Botha, and the, conquer, um, the conquest of German East Africa, which was led by Jan Smith himself. And when time came to make peace um, the, and sign the Treaty of Versailles, uh, the two men were sent to um, Paris to represent South Africa, and that's when the photo was taken. Uh, and um, and Smith uh, was actually one of the people that drafted the uh, Covenant of the League of Nations, which was sort of the predecessor to the United Nations that we have today. Um, I forgot to add one just fun fact about Smith. Uh, he was recognized um, by the British Empire for his um, uh, intelligence and strategic um, uh, abilities. And he was actually a member of the Imperial War Cabinet during World War I. Um, and while in London, he recommended that uh, the British Empire should, or Britain should form a separate military um, branch, the Royal Air Force. So this was the beginning of the British uh, Air Force thanks to Jan Smith. Um, Botha died in 1919, leaving the deputy Smith as prime minister, uh, and uh, he would hold this office until Herzog, uh, General J.B.M. Herzog, um, won the elections in 1924. Uh, and one of the uh, main events during Smith's time as prime minister was the Rand Rebellion of 1922. It actually started off as a mine worker strike, 
that in Johannesburg that turned into a full-blown rebellion um, with trenches being dug up in the streets and um, uh, and Smiths again uh, did not hesitate to use the military against them. Uh, he sent in 20,000 troops, <laughs> tanks, and actually uh, bombed uh, the place from the air. So 153 people were killed. Um, and uh, I think I should uh, mention uh, why Afrikaners would be so mad at Jan Smith for that, because most of the mine workers, uh, the strike was just white mine workers, uh, because the black mine workers uh, were not... Uh, even though both sides had it bad, the whites were upset partly because the blacks were taking over their jobs. So you wouldn't strike together if one of the demands is to have a, a power bar um, in place so that the whites would get the better jobs. So um, it was the white mine workers that were striking and um, because of the social uh, classes, the English uh, were, the English South Africans were mostly the richer people and the Afrikaners were the poorer people. So we can assume that all or almost all of the strikers were um, Afrikaners. So having a Boer War hero uh, bomb you from the air um, would, I think, make some people consider that treason. Um, let's move on to the next one. Uh, which I just uh, entitled Fusion, uh, but um, so Smith, like I said, was, was head of the South African party and uh, Herzog was head of the Nationalist party. And uh, 1934, um, this is when South Africa, along with the entire world, uh, has experienced the Great Depression after World War One. Uh, and uh, that meant that um, Herzog, who was Prime Minister, was willing to do basically anything to combat it, including um, not just a coalition with his main opponent, but actually fusing the two parties together into one uh, party, which became the United Party, hence the name. Uh, and uh, this uh, was uh, another uh, split in Afrikanerdom because uh, the famous Diet Malan decided at this point that um, he will uh, form his own party, the Khasaiverde National Party, or the Purified National Party. Uh, and um, this, this issue uh, did split Afrikanerdom, even uh, the Prime Minister's own son, his eldest son Albert, we all heard about him because that's what my PhD is about. Uh, he actually went with the Malan instead of his father. So, um, so the, the uh, split was pretty severe, though not as severe, I think, um, as uh, the 1939 uh, split. Um, okay, let me rephrase. No, it's, we're all friends, so let me um, correct my mistakes. Um, this would have been the split in, within Afrikanerdom, so within nationalists themselves, because you had the National Party that um, those who followed Herzog to uh, cooperate with Smith, and then those that followed the Manan uh, to be the real National Party. Uh, a few years later, you would have um, the split caused by World War I that became a very severe split between the English South Africans and the Afrikaners. So, um, what happened was World War II broke out, and again, Afrikaners, those that were a bit more extremist, uh, thought, okay, well, we uh, should definitely not fight on the side of the British. Um, we would have to go into details about why, not, it, it, why during the First World War it was not really possible to, um, to be neutral in the conflict, but point is, what they wanted is to declare neutrality. So the Prime Minister Herzog uh, wanted to, so wanted South Africa to remain neutral, and 
appease those that um, would actually have preferred to fight on the side of the Germans. Uh, and um, uh, basically, <laughs> well, what could have happened, I guess, is not part of history, but it is interesting to think of what, uh, what South African history would have looked like if, uh, if the neut neutrality motion did pass in Parliament. But it didn't. Uh, Herzog resigned and Smith became prime minister and he declared war on, Ger on, Ger sorry, on Germany. Um, and basically all the Afrikaners that still remained in the party with Herzog now left. So any Afrikaners that stayed in the United Party were considered very British and Anglicized Afrikaners um, who did not have the best interests of the folk at heart. Um, World War II, um, uh, so in, during World War II, uh, certain Afrikaners were willing to resort to um, paramilitary activities like the Osama Brampa movement, uh, and um, Smets was more than ready to put them in jail. So, for example, future um, Prime Minister Forster was one of those that uh, was a member of the Osama Brampa, was uh, involved in sabotage, and ended up uh, spending a few months in a camp uh, prepared for, for those. Um, uh, for that specific <laughs> special occasion. Uh, so uh, Smith again showed that he is okay with um, imprisoning uh, the Afrikaners. And, and uh, yet, um, not quite by his own people, but uh, we have a photo of Smith with Winston Churchill, so the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Uh, they were very good friends, and considering the fact that none of them had a lot of friends, or neither of them had a lot of friends. Um, it's it's interesting that uh, they they found um, uh, friendship, uh, yeah, uh, on. Uh, okay, it's just the two of us. So Churchill actually met met during the Boer War. Uh, he was a prisoner. Um, he was a journalist, and he was a prisoner of war. And he actually met Smith during that time. Uh, and um, I'm not sure how deep their friendship was at the very beginning, uh, considering that one of them was holding the other one uh, in prison. But, um, but once Smith became you know, head of South Africa, they did uh, see each other uh, once in a while. And uh, they wrote lots of letters. Um, there's a book and a movie about their friendship, so if you're interested, uh, ask Michael, he knows the titles. Um, <laughs> uh, what else? Um, he is next became a field marshal in the British Army, and like after World War One, when the Second World War ended, he was um, uh, involved in uh, drawing up um, the uh, Charter of the United Nations. Uh, in 1948, so a few years after the war, he became the opposition leader because Diaz Malang uh, won the elections. Um, interestingly enough, Smith received just under 50% of the popular vote, uh, and Malang received uh, less than 40. But because of weighing um, votes in favor of the rural uh, constituencies, uh, Malang uh, Malang's votes counted more because they came from the rural areas. Okay, we can go on to communists. So the famous Bernd Fischer, um, probably uh, the most famous Afrikaner that was communist, um, and his wife, uh, Molly. Uh, Bram was the grandson of um, the Prime Minister of Orange River Colony, which was the Free State under the British. Uh, his name was also Abraham Fisher. Uh, so his grandson um, becomes uh, one of the main communists in South Africa in history. Uh, he married Molly, who was the niece of Jan Smith, which I think uh, should ring um, or should set up a, a red light 
since Smith wasn't very liked, we can only assume that his niece would have uh, similar um, uh, views to him, though I guess she went even further because she was an actual member of the Communist Party. She even uh, ran for a seat on the city council in Johannesburg um, as, a, um, as a candidate of the Communist Party. She uh, was banned by the Minister of Justice from most of the organizations she was part of and <clears throat> even from um, like public gatherings uh, for five years. Uh, and after Sharp Law in 1960, uh, when martial law was introduced and the 90-day clause uh, was um, first, uh, first used, she was imprisoned for three months without trial. Uh, soon after uh, the Rivonia trial that her husband was involved in in 1964, uh, the couple had a driving or a car accident and Molly um, died. Uh, but her husband, uh, we obviously have more information about him. Uh, I was wondering if, if there ever will be as much information on um, uh, females, even in the 20th century, as there is about men. But uh, for the purpose of this uh, presentation, uh, I'll just focus on what's available. So Bram was a law student, again, I think you're starting to see a pattern, <laughs> at Oxford this time. Uh, and while he was in Europe in the 1930s, he traveled to Soviet Russia. Uh, and uh, he realized that the situation uh, of the um, Soviet peasants was similar to that of the black South Africans. So um, great poverty. That's why he became a member of the Communist Party of South Africa uh, until it um, was banned in 1950. And then he was involved in the creation uh, of the South African Communist Party um, in 1953. Uh, but it was underground as communism was illegal uh, and he became its uh, chairman. Treason trial um, was uh, the trial of um, many ANC leaders that were uh, accused of treason uh, between 1956 and 1961 and Graham was part uh, of the defense team uh, for um, those men. Although I put it, the judge claimed that there was no proof that the ANC was a communist, sorry, was a communist uh, organization nor that they were planning to use violence to overthrow the government. Uh, and then the Rivonia trial came, just a few years later. Uh, again, Nelson Mandela, Walter Shisu, um, they were um, on a trial for treason. Uh, and uh, they... Okay, so Bram was the, the leader of the defense team. What is interesting is that there was a bit of a conflict of interest as um, he was actually involved in all the conspiracies that they were planning. Uh, he was just not caught when they were when the raid happened uh, and all the ANC leaders were brought in. So um, there was actually evidence given in court with his handwriting on it, uh, but uh, and he knew it uh, and even his partner, junior partners knew it, uh, but they kept quiet. He obviously didn't say anything. Uh, but knowing that some of the witnesses might have been able to identify him when they would be, uh, when he knew that they would be called onto the stand that day, he would leave the, the word to his junior partners and just say that he's busy with a different case. Um, it was uh, successful in the sense that uh, no one was um, given the death penalty. This was probably uh, the result of um, international pressure, which uh, was uh, increasing uh, at that time against apartheid. Um, and uh, the nationalist government decided, or well, the judge technically decided not to give them the death penalty. But um, it was probably due to the great uh, international pressure not to. Uh, he himself uh, was uh, arrested 
shortly afterwards. Oh, so remember this, after this, this is when his wife dies. Uh, a few months later, she is arrested uh, and he is actually um, uh, let out on bail because he had a case to attend to in London. Uh, so um, a colleague uh, uh, put up his bail, he flew to London, he won the case uh, and he came back like he promised in his application for bail uh, because he said that I'm an Afrikaner, my home is in South Africa, I will not leave my country because my political beliefs conflict with those of the government. So he lived up uh, to his word, he did come back, uh, but when the uh, uh, trial started again, uh, he one day did go missing. Uh, he went underground uh, and he actually uh, paid back the bail so that his friend wouldn't uh, lose um, or yeah, suffer any financial loss. Um, and uh, he was underground for just a few months. Uh, the next year, 1965, uh, he was caught. Uh, put on trial for um, furthering communism and um, planning to overthrow the government. So he was given life imprisonment. Uh, while in prison, he became quite sick. Uh, at one point, he apparently slipped and fell in the shower, and he um, uh, didn't. What was the? Oh, fractured. Yeah, he fractured his um, hip and neck. And they made him wait like two weeks before he could go to the hospital. Uh, so um, uh, his colleagues uh, in prison uh, recalled that when he came back, he was um, he, he was quite disoriented and uh, looking really bad. And uh, his um, he he kind of faded away uh, quite quickly. Uh, he was then diagnosed with cancer, and only two months before his death, he was allowed to. Um, to move out of prison um, and to remain under house arrest. And he died in 1975. Um, we will now talk about the Progressive Party. Uh, so, uh, the one woman that's here, that's Helen Suzman, but she's not Afrikaans, so we won't talk about her. Um, what, a uh, few words about the party itself. Uh, all these members were actually members of the United Party, uh, but in 1959 they, um, they had a bit of a disagreement uh, over racial policy. These people wanted um, the United Party to be more liberal and more, um, uh, uh, well, and, um, more uh, helpful to the non-whites in South Africa, uh, so they left. But because they were already members of parliament, uh, they um, remained members of parliament until the next elections. So we will talk, 1961, but I will mention it twice, uh, two more times. So we will talk about life on the Reinefeld and Zarka Beer. So life on the Reinefeld, um, he was a law student at Oxford. Um, and uh, he actually, while there, he uh, played for the English national team. Uh, he was a rugby player. And then when he came back to South Africa, he played for the South African national team of cricket. Uh, he captained uh, a few matches as well, or tests, I guess it's called, but games. Anyway. Um, and he only quit in 1958, which is interesting considering the fact that he joined politics a year earlier. Uh, so he was a lawyer, a sportsman, and a politician. Uh, in 1957, he was uh, elected to parliament by the constituents in um, East London. Uh, and in 1959, when um, the Progressive Party was formed, he was one of the founding members. And in 1961, he lost his parliamentary seat. That was basically the end of his uh, political career. Um, but remember, he was a law student, so um, afterwards he was uh, he practiced law in Cape Town, and the um, case that was probably the most uh, okay, I don't want to say interesting in this case, um, uh, important uh, in his life 
who was uh, following the tribal rights of 1962. Uh, these riots were organized by the Pan-African Congress, so the PAC, and its military wing, the POCO. Um, he was uh, defending five men that were accused of leading the riots. Uh, unfortunately, three out of five of them were sentenced to death, and um, the sentence was carried out, so they were hanged. Um, and he died in 2018, so he lived 90 years, and uh, he was very much alive during our lifetime. <laughs> Sorry. So now this is what happens. Okay. I told Michael I will not need to go back to my presentation. Why not? Um, so, uh, next guy, Zarko Uh He studied medicine at the only one. University of Cape Town. <laughs> so um, he uh, did not go to England for his studies. Uh, he joined the United Party and was uh, elected in 1953. Um, apparently, he was the youngest uh, man to be elected a member of parliament because he was 24 years old. Uh, so until I'm 29, it hurts a bit. Um, he uh, was in politics until 196 or in parliament until 1961 uh, when the Progressive Party lost all their seats except for Helen Sussman uh, in the elections. And he went and joined um, Anglo American, so uh, Harry Oppenheimer's uh, company. Uh, he even served as one of the directors um, between 1974 and 1988. So quite long that he was in the business world. Uh, and in uh, 1977, he was re-elected to parliament as a member of the Progressive Federal Party, uh, which uh, was um, followed up on the Progressive Party uh, and was the predecessor of the Democratic Party that he became uh, a leader of, which was a predecessor of the Democratic Alliance today. He himself, uh, was actually quite involved in um, drafting the interim constitution for South Africa. So his um, uh, participation in the transition uh, uh, earned him um, an acknowledgement from Nelson Mandela, who appointed him ambassador to the Netherlands. So it was like he really represented South Africa in the Netherlands between 1994 and 1996. Uh, A.G. Sailor Malan. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard his name, uh, but um, he uh, does did come from uh, the Malans of the Cape. Uh, though uh, I'm not sure uh, how closely he re related he was to the F. Malan. Um, I read he was a distant cousin, but that might have been just a metaphor for you know, the, the Huguenot that came in, uh, was it 1688? Uh, that, that's their, their connection. But um, it is interesting that you had two Malans uh, at one point against each other, Diet Malan is Prime Minister, and Sailor Malan. So his story is that uh, he was sent to New High School, which was actually uh, at the age of 14, so it's, I guess in South Africa, that's the beginning of high school. Um, he was actually sent to a school that's on a ship. <laughs> so he was um, thought to be uh, a cadet, but uh, received his normal education as well. Uh, and then he joined the, um, a British private um, uh, merchant line which took him to Nazi Germany, to the ports of Nazi Germany in the 30s. And what he saw there, the rise of fascism, was something that he was not liking, which uh, made him, uh, I guess, ignited this liberalism in him uh, that he would um, follow all his life. Uh, in 1935, he joined the Royal Air Force. Uh, and even before the war, he was already lieutenant. 
So he um, was a decorated officer during World War II. Uh, I know Michael would like to hear more about that, but if you guys are interested about all the Operation Overlords and Battle of Britain and all of that that he was involved in, um, there are articles about that. Uh, I can let you know. But what um, I want to get to is the next point, which is the Torch Commando. So when he came back to South Africa after World War II, um, he uh, began to cooperate with Harry Oppenheimer uh, and the Anglo-American Company, uh, which financed this uh, newly formed uh, group, uh, the Torch Commando. Uh, it was an organization made of veterans, South African veterans of World War II, uh, and um, they decided to organize uh, and fund this organization in 1951 during this so-called constitutional crisis, uh, which occurred when the Nationalist Party um, enlarged the Senate um, in order to uh, modify the Constitution, because you need two-thirds to modify the Constitution, uh, and they did not have um, enough people, so they said, they simply enlarged the Senate, like added constituent or other constituencies, and changed the uh, the way that seats in the Senate were allocated. Uh, so it was uh, a bit like most. Uh, I'm just uh, comparing it to America because I'm sure all of you have been interested in American elections this year. <laughs> so it's similar in the sense of um, instead of having a few seats from Pennsylvania. Uh, for Trump and a few seats for Biden, the person that, uh, the one person wins the entire state and gets all of the seats. So the National Party decided to do that with the elections to the Senate in South Africa. In South Africa. Uh, and, uh, and this way they were uh, able to get the two thirds majority needed. And this allowed them to remove the um, colored uh, population from the Cape, uh, from the common voters roll. So um, this uh, smelled a little bit of um, fascism to Malan. Um, he was not uh, liking where the nationalist movement in South Africa was going. Uh, so he um, uh, organized with the, the other um, ex-servicemen. Uh, he became president of this torch commando and the way they would protest was to uh, stand at night in front of the parliament with torches. Uh, so it was very visible how many of them um, were out there. Uh, there were actually up to a quarter of a million members. Uh, however, the uh, organization was not very successful and Malan retired. Uh, but what is interesting is the Torch Commando, uh, even though it's not researched very well, um, has left uh, a significant um, mark on South African history because it was basically the last organized white opposition to apartheid. Um, and with a quarter of a million uh, people, uh, it, uh, it, it was mostly English South Africans, but I mean, you have an Afrikaner as president, and there were other Afrikaans members as well. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it, it definitely needs um, more attention from academics uh, and the general public as well. Um, what's also interesting about the torch window is that uh, usually in world history you don't get uh, military men uh, getting together to protect the constitution. You know, usually it's to overthrow the government. So uh, it's just unique that um, these men, uh, which is also understandable, I mean, they fought, they um, put their life. Um, at risk, they saw men killed uh, defending um, Britain from the threat of fascism. So they didn't want to come back uh, to their own country 
and see a similar movement arise. And the last question we will talk about is the Hindia. Uh, he um, uh, also died pretty quickly. Uh, so we were all alive by oh, sorry, the one we were almost all of us <laughs> were alive by then. Um, Devs Nidia, he was the son of Isua Nidia, who um, was uh, very Afrikaans. He fought in the Boer War, he became uh, an NG reverend, and he was one of the founders of the African Buddha Bund. Uh, and his son followed in his footsteps. He also became an NG reverend and joined the Buddha Bund. His um, position on nationalism changed in 1960 with the Sharpeville um, events, or uh, commonly known as the Sharpeville Massacre. Um, I am sure you have all heard um, of it, but uh, five to seven thousand uh, black people organized and marched onto a small uh, police station. Uh, the police uh, opened fire and 69 people were killed. Um, following this, the government declared martial law uh, and uh, a lot of people were imprisoned, like Molly Fisher during that time. Um, uh, and in general, the, the country was um, in an upheaval. Uh, and uh, at the end of that year, uh, the World Council of Churches, including some of the Dutch Reformed churches, um, had a conference and they published the so-called Kakastu Declaration, uh, which um, uh, basically said that the uh, nationalist policies are to blame for the situation in the country and this needs to change. So they made uh, certain points, um, but it is actually very interesting um, if you want to Google it and read on Wikipedia. Uh, but um, uh, following, and the issue here was one of the delegates to that um, conference. Uh, following um, the reprisal of Badbud and the government, uh, the, officially the Dutch Reformed churches retracted their statements, uh, except for Fierce Media, who decided that um, actually what he has been taught and probably preaching uh, is uh, actually not true. Uh, he he uh, realized that apartheid is indefensible, um, uh, at least it's indefensible using the Bible. Um, the Bible does not uh, preach uh, apartheid. Uh, and he was, um, he had to leave uh, his uh, uh, congregation. Uh, he was expelled from the Bruder Bond. Uh, well, he did leak papers, um, but it was all part of uh, his change of heart. Um, and uh, in um, 1963, so um, in, in the three years following Sharpeville, uh, he created the Christian Institute of Southern Africa with, uh, um, with Reverend Albert uh, Heise. Uh, who actually came from the Hervorum but uh, was but uh, also, um, also became an um, anti-apartheid activist. Uh, their institute, institute was actually banned in 1977 by the government, so they were doing something right. Um, he himself uh, personally uh, cooperated with the ANC uh, during the apartheid era and um, when the ANC began its negotiations with the National Party, he was uh, actually one of the, uh, the negotiators for the ANC, which is pretty surprising considering he's an Afrikaner. Uh, and uh, his, um, his involvement uh, in all of this and his activism against apartheid uh, was uh, acknowledged, I think, by the fact that uh, in 2004, so. 10 years into ANC rule, and he was actually given a state funeral, um, which means paid by the state. And uh, let me end off with his quote uh, 
just to put to you that it's not based on his name, but based on what he felt that he's uh, an Afrikaner. Uh, I saw myself never as anything else but an Afrikaner, and I'm very grateful for the small contribution which I could have made. And that is that. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>